Okay, guys, we are back. We got Arctic Mind coming up. He's going to be giving a talk on a model for the fundamental value of Monero. So this should be a very interesting one. Those that are interested in why Monero may have any value to begin with, Arctic's going to break it down in the most fundamental form. Take it away. Thank you for the great introduction. Uh, for those who you know, I normally go as Arctic Mine on, on the webs. Um, my name is Francisco Cabanas. I live in Vancouver. I'm one of the members of the uh, Monero core team, been involved with Monero since uh, 2014, um, and uh, was involved with the core team since 2016. So what we're going to talk about is fundamental value. Um, why, why uh, is there a fundamental value to a cryptocurrency, and in particular Monero? Now, the, this, the nature of this uh, particular topic, because we're talking of potential investment returns, etc., this is critical. Uh, this is the only part that's going to be bilingual. Um, disclaimer, descargo de responsabilidad. This is not financial advice. Esto no es un consejo financiero. The information in this presentation is not intended as financial advice. Past performance is not indicative of future return, nor is it indicative of future risk. La información en esta presentación no pretende ser un consejo financiero. El rendimiento pasado no es indicativo del rendimiento futuro, ni es indicativo del riesgo futuro. So now we got the... So the the first approach we're going to look at is the Austrian economics perspective. Um, and one of the most interesting books in Austrian economics, and one of the simplest, is Karl Menger's uh, On the Origins of Money. What I really like about this, it is relatively short, about 50 pages long. Uh, for those who might not know who Karl Menger is, Karl Menger founded the Austrian School of Economics. He's basically the mentor of people like Mises and Heinck. Uh, uh, this work was um, first published uh, in uh, 1892. It's available for download from the Weisses Institute. And it's a really concise and to the point introduction of the fundamentals of Austrian economics. So sable, sale Saleableness is a bit of an interesting word. It's a bit of a cake. The German is Abstraffigkeit. The problem is by the scratch of commodities. So what are we really talking about here? What we're talking about, if we take a, a series of commodities in a marketplace, which is the commodity that I'd most likely be able to use as money is the commodity has the highest characteristics, such as marketability, saleability, sales, cap, uh, sale, sales capacity, sales ability, very high liquidity, and very low friction costs or free costs. So for example, if I take a purchase this commodity and they want to sell it back, I have the lowest loss, the lowest uh, spread in trading that commodity. So that commodity is the one that has the strongest sale, sale uh, saleableness. Um, the concept is basically, I'm, I'm going to return it. How much of my money I'm going to get back? How much of my value am I going to get back? So very high liquidity and very low friction. So the reason why precious metals has become the general current media exchange, this is a quote from um, the Menga uh, among here, is that it's a nation prior to its appearance in history and in the sequel among all peoples of advanced economic civilization is because of that sal saleableness. So this is the argument why gold is so commonly used of money. The perspective here, we're talking in the 1890s. Um, and at the same time, because they are found to be specially qualified for the con concomitant and subsidiary, subsidiary functions of money, Carl Menger, Origins of Money, page 45. So the implication here is that you need a commodity that has what generally is considered the seven characteristics of money, durability, so it doesn't just decay while it's sitting there, portability, divisibility, uniformity, and fungibility, which is one of the topics that's really talked about in Monero, limited supply, and acceptability. 
And these are historically well-known and precious metals, particularly gold. So the Austrian economics then also has this relatively subsidiary approach to the role of the state. Um, the state's measures have not first money that are out of precious metals, but have only perfected them in the function of money. And a great example of this is a state takes a, a piece of gold, mints it into a coin, and then takes that coin and says, well, this is how much fineness it has. This is what its weight is. And so everybody recognizes that coin so they know how much gold they're getting. And there's a little premium to that, which could be considered seniorage. A great example with silver in the Roman Empire started with the denarius, originally about 95% silver. Then they get into the basement. And this is some, that can happen. The state decides, well, we can get away with putting less and less silver in this thing. And, and about three centuries later, the, the successors had like 1% like silver in. But the basic concept is the state can actually enhance it, but it's not the main driver. They kind of improve it a bit. And an example is telling people what you're getting in terms of how much gold and how fine it is. So the next point that we look at is what's called the equation of exchange. Now, this might sound like a strong jumble going all of a sudden from an Austrian topic to what's generally accepted to be a Keynesian topic. Um, but the equation of exchange in its most basic form is uh, MV equals PQ. M is the, money, the total money supply. V, v is the velocity of money. And when we're talking about money supply, we're talking M0. So in the case of Monero, it would be the actual Monero on the blockchain, not fractional reserve banking. In the case of fiat, again, you're talking, and say, for example, the United States, we're talking about uh, bank reserves from the Federal Reserve and um, cash in circulation. So we're not talking M1 or M2, et cetera. There's no banking and fractional reserve banking involvement. And then price is the price level of, of goods and services in the economy. And Q is a, an index of all the real expenditures on newly produced goods and services. It's actually an identity. We're simply saying, um, you know, you take how much money is on one side of the, of, the, of the ledger, how much money is on the other side of the ledger, and they're both equal. So that's what we're saying. This is a simplified version of the broader base, where you basically take MV equals PIQI, where you look through every single price of every single goods or service, and you look at every single price. So you're looking at cups of coffees and houses and uh, other cryptocurrencies and uh, haircuts, et cetera. Uh, and this, now, this is very much commonly used in, in, in Keynesian arguments, and it's also by the monetarists. In this talk, I'm going to apply it to another application, which is not as commonly understood, which is currencies that are harder than gold, so more than uh, Austrian currencies. But it's important to say it lies at the foundation of Keynesian economics, mostly used for fiat currencies, where the money supply is controlled by a central state authority or a central bank. And of course, the more controversial issue is that what they're saying is we're going to increase the money supply M, they're trying to increase Q, and what they really get is an increase in P. Or vice versa, they're trying to reduce P, and what they get is a reduction in Q. So they really only control the product of the two. And this is where the whole argument between monetarists and Keynesians come in, and why the banking, you always see the Federal Reserve is trying to reduce inflation, but at the same time, not cause a crash in the market. That's the, the dilemma of the banking dilemma. However, the key thing here is there's no reason why it cannot be applied to an economy where gold is used as money, and this is the Austrian example, or even a fiat currency where the money supply is fixed or false with time. So we look at it from the point of the, uh, using gold as money, and it's really quite boring because what actually happens is that M tracks Q. And this might surprise people, but historically gold has been known as a store of value. One very common and favorite example is uh, the, the attire of a senator. You look at the cost of the attire of a member of the Roman Senate two millennia ago, and it was approximately, and I emphasize approximately, one ounce of gold. Uh, then two millennia later, you look at the cost of attire of a member of the United States Senate, 
and it's also approximately one ounce of gold. That's quite remarkable. So what we're saying is it keeps its value, M tracks Q, roughly, not exactly. I mean, someone's going to say, I found a suit of clothes uh, for $500, and I can say 4000 so gold is too high or too low. But on an average long-term basis, it tracks it. And also with a cycle, I would say typically in, in the terms of decades. So you're obviously going to see significant variations in the short term. But over this long term, particularly uh, decades to millennia, gold has tracked economic activity. And the main argument for this is that you really think of gold, we should think of it not as a scarce resource, but as a very plentiful or even infinite resource. I mean, we could argue the, the universe is infinite and there's an infinite amount of gold, therefore. Um, but which is very, very expensive and difficult to extract and concentrate. And so what happens is as economic activity improve, goes up, it is economically attractive to uh, mine more gold, to prospect for it, to extract it, etc. And then that kind of brings the price of gold back down to that economic level. Similarly, if the price, uh, if the economy goes down, then typically what happens is the mining stops. And again, there's a delay. This is where you get the cycle. And eventually, I think, meets back to an equilibrium. So this is why we see this, this long-term uh, case. But what the key point is, is when you're looking at gold as money, the equation of exchange is just boring. It's not interesting. Because essentially, all you're saying is that money supply is tracking economic Grow, uh, the economic size of the economy. So I'm tracking Q. So now we'll return to the question of stableness and we'll fast forward to the early 21st century. And we'll ask a question of Bitcoin and Monero. And so what exactly is the motivation here? So the motivation is digital commodity money. And by that I'm taking uh, um, with better stableness than existing centralized ledger forms of digital money. This is kind of what Satoshi set out to do. So let's create a new commodity, a digital commodity, that has better stableness than the existing credit cards and debit cards and bank transfers, etc. And in principle, if there is a significant portion of the economy where this is the case, then this thing has a, a, a very useful economic value. So for example, the centralized ledgers of digital money are very poor, particularly in some specific cases. Economically, marginalized, poor people are involved. A great example is paying a person who is experiencing homelessness whilst, and I emphasize whilst, that person is experiencing homelessness. Are you gonna use Apple Pay? No. Are you gonna use a debit card? No. Credit card? No. Cash would work. In 2012, Bitcoin would work. And today Monero works. So that is an example where you're particularly paying um, marginalized and poor people in a general sense. The other one is where they are the payoffs. It's a, it's a similar situation. So you're dealing with those type of transactions. That's the first group. The second group that's very significant is international transactions, even involving privileged and wealthy individuals that are cross-border. And a classic example of this is I go to a hotel in Toronto. I book a room. I'm successfully financial. Um, I pay with my credit card. Probably a hotel is going to pay about 1%, 1.5% 1, 1 in, in merchant fees on this credit card transaction. It's domestic, et cetera. I get 1% cash back. The cost of that transaction is 0.5%. I would argue, for example, Monero have a tough time competing with that. Now do the same thing in a hotel in Mexico City. And you have two more factors. The first one is that the card is now foreign rather than domestic, so there's a big surcharge. Uh, and so they're going to be charged a lot more money. And at the same time, I get a hidden surcharge, and believe me, the credit card companies go out of the way to hide this, to um, in the Canadian dollar to Mexican peso spread. So I'm not getting the mid-market rate. I'm getting probably paid about 5%. For example, I was told uh, I, had a, I had a taxi to go to the hotel, and then if I were to pay with a credit card, it was a 5% surcharge. 
So now what could be half a point can become closer to even 10, 5, 10%. So you're looking at easily 10 times the amount just because we crossed an international boundary. So within Canada, 0.5, Mexico probably 6 or 7%. I still get my 1% cash back if I use my Canadian credit card, but there is this huge difference in stableness. So we'll go back and look at the question. Can we create a commodity that does better? And now we really go for the jackpot here, and we combine the two. And what we end up with is with remittances. So you have poor people taking low and marginal jobs, there are immigrants or temporary workers in a wealthy country, could be North America, Europe, the Middle East, saving their meager salaries and then turning around and sending a portion of that to support a family back in some developed country. El Salvador being a perfect example. Easily 20% or more could be gone in fees in these transfers. There is a reason why El Salvador looked at Bitcoin. They were concerned about remittances. 25% of the GDP of El Salvador is remittances. Very close to that. So they looked at past alternatives. They picked the wrong kind, though. But that's another story. So transaction fees. So now you have a real motivation to create a commodity where you could turn the Austrian principle of stableness and say, I'm going to do better than these credit card companies. And that was the motivation for Bitcoin, and of course, the motivation in 2014 for Monero. Now keep in mind that when you start talking about a lot of the features of Monero, privacy, fungibility, etc. These kind of frictions hurt stableness. So if you have a very private fungible currency, then that's going to be a lot more stable than the one where you pay for something and then get charged with a crime you had nothing to do with, which can happen, for example, in Bitcoin. So obviously, the Monero pay is going to be a lot more saleable, saleable no, than the uh, Bitcoin payment where I, I run the risk of a, uh, of a bogus or a criminal charge. That's an extreme case, but, uh, but that's the example of what I'm talking about. So the real issue then is Bitcoin initially had good stableness. This is what I'm talking 2011, 2012, 2013. And has lost it, especially with small transactions, mainly because the fees were very high. So you have a situation where the fees were so high because you restricted the blood size, so people couldn't really transact for small transactions. And of course, the rise of blockchain surveillance, which is what I was um, mentioning before. Um, the serious questions regarding the security of Bitcoin with block rewards. Well, this is a controversial topic, which is a bit outside of this discussion, but there's a ticking time bomb as the block rewards. So there's no guarantee at all that transaction fees are gonna replace block reward in any of the variants of Bitcoin. I don't care what we're talking about Bitcoin Core or BTC, or Bitcoin Cash, or Bitcoin SV, or Bitcoin Gold, they all have the same fundamental problem. There's no evidence that this is gonna work. The transaction fees will replace it. We know that a block reward comparable to that of Monero works, because Monero has been doing that for already for a year. Uh, but we have no idea what's gonna happen down the road. So that's a big one. So Monero at this point is very good. Sable, sableness, experience, especially for small transactions, very low fees, adaptive block size, fun, fun, fungibility and privacy, constant block rewards ensuring long-term security. It's slightly lower saleableness than Bitcoin for very large transactions because we're a much smaller chain. Our market cap is about a 200th of that of Bitcoin. So you obviously, if you're gonna buy multi-million dollar pieces of property, for example, Bitcoin would be a better choice than Monero. And you really don't care about the $40 fee that you're going to pay on the block side if you're spending $5 million on real estate. So that, that's kind of where Bitcoin is kind of still strong, vis a -vis Monero. That could change in the future, of course. So small market capitalization. So now we're going to look at deriving a fundamental value for Monero. Okay, so what do we know? Well, we know that Monero has a stale emission or minimum emission, 0.66 a mile per block. And we know also, and there's an interesting theory, and I will reference uh, Peter Todd's uh, article in 2002, and uh, which was originally put together by Smooth, which is one of the Monero core team members back in about 2015, I believe 2016. And that is that the, in Monero, what you're really gonna get is not a constant inflation of 0.66 mile per block, 
but an equilibrium between these block rewards or minimum emission and lost coins. So people are gonna lose coins and boarding accidents, quote, not as much as some people pretend that it is happening, uh, but you're gonna get a few losses and that's gonna be an equilibrium with the block reward. And so essentially we'll reach that equilibrium and the money supply will reach that equilibrium somewhat about where we are right now, maybe a bit more, a bit less. We don't know exactly where that's gonna be because the whole thing's private, that's really interesting. But the one thing we can say is that it's gonna be harder than gold. So we can look at, we should really look at the inflation rate at the tail emission as the worst possible case from the, play, from the point of inflation. It's likely gonna be harder than this 0.6x of R because of lost coins. And we're gonna end up in some kind of stability between the two. If you wanna read more on the subject, I recommend Peter Todd's article where he actually covers this issue and the mathematics behind it. Uh, why will you reach such a conclusion? Okay, so what we have is optimal. We have this minimum block reward just below gold, but it's still harder than Austrian money. And as I'll point in a moment, harder than Austrian money is important to ensure that we have a, 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 a you can, we can jumpstart the currency basically. So it's uh, Monero is close to optimal to ensure a security while exceeding the gold hard money standard of Austrian economics, namely gold the stealth. So the equation of exchange with cost and M predicts a drop in P deflation with the growth in Q. So what happens now is on average, your velocity is gonna be constant, but now you increase the market size of the Monero economy, you have to have deflation because you have a constant supply. So the Monero economy by its very nature is gonna be deflationary. There are gonna be many people that are motivated to, to use Monero simply because of the saleableness. We've got to go back to that because they're saving money on that remittance. If I can send the remittance using Monero for say 10 cents rather than $20, that is a reason for me to buy Monero for that purpose. The fact that I may lose the further opportunity on that $200, I might be tempted to take the $20 that I'm saving in Western Union and, and, and just keep that portion of the Monero and save it for the kid's education while the family gets the same amount they would have got from Western Union. So there is an opportunity for saving there, but still the incentive to use a deflationary currency simply because you have lower fees and lower friction that you would have with the more mainstream inflationary currencies. So what happens then is there's a reason for that. So now, put yourself in the perspective of the investor or the speculator. The investor or the speculator looks at this and say, hmm, I see a financial opportunity here. If I study enough the cryptocurrency, and this is where the disclaimer comes in because it's really important that this is not financial advice, I can put money up, buy Monero, hold it, with the expectation that as Q increases, I'm gonna see a return because of the falling P. So all you're assuming is the equation of exchange, but now we turn around and you create an attractive investment opportunity. Investment speculation in Monero creates a market capitalization and liquidity. What does that do? What that does is it creates, it jumpstarts the economy because now someone is saying the Monero has value, which in, in, in the case of gold is a pre-existing value of the commodity. In, in, case, in cases of uh, fiat currencies, it's the state theory of money, which is in generally the state says it has value. So for example, you can pay taxes with it or you can settle disputes with it in our courts. Um, and this leads to this fundamental value of M. So now you have the money supply has to have a value simply because of the better sale saleableness of Monero vis-a-vis -vis credit cards, for example, in Western Union and so on. And this is, manifested by the attractiveness of speculation and investment. Now, that speculation and investment also facilitates the market because it provides liquidity. So you get a feedback loop, a positive feedback loop developing. So there is a fundamental value from this, and this also is 
a feedback loop that jumpstarts the currency. So it's essentially the speculation investment theory of money where you jumpstart the, the currencies with speculation and investment. But the fundamental value is derived from the fact that that person sending $200 to El Salvador is gonna pay 10 cents or two cents, one cent or whatever, rather than say $20. That has an economic value in the economy, which leads to a commodity value for Monero. And that's a key point to understand. If you beat the existing economies, the, the saleableness is gonna make it, it's the same argument that is made by the Austrians for gold. It becomes a, a more natural, attractive commodity, even though it's been engineered, it's essentially to do this. Um, that's what drives that fundamental value. Now, the more interesting question at this point is, can we relate Q for a cryptocurrency to the block size? Now, this is my favorite topic. So, the particular transaction rate. Well, obviously, if you have a given distribution of goods and services in your economy, and you simply increase it, and that economy, the key assumption is that the economic activity Q is primarily on chain. The answer is yes. Now, by on chain, is, for example, it could be a situation where somebody goes to a KYC exchange, deposits US dollars, buys Monero. The US dollars is settled on the banking system. The Monero is withdrawn as per the recommendations of the community, otherwise known as Monero run. That Monero is settled on chain. So from the perspective of the Monero blockchain, that is a decentralized transaction on chain. The fact that the counter party transaction was settled in the US banking system, or the Canadian banking system, or the European banking system, does not change the fact that the Monero side of the transaction was decentralized. So you have one, one decentralized, one centralized. The case where it's not on chain would be, it's left in the exchange and then traded, then you have a banking system, or MSV system of Monero. So that's not gonna show up on the Monero blockchain. What will show on the Monero blockchain is when it's withdrawn. So yes, it's a, the, if there's no change in the distribution of Q, TX will be proportional to Q, leading to a linear relationship between Q and TX. So what you expect is a linear relationship in this scenario between the transaction rate and the size of the economy. There is a twist to this. As you increase the size of the economy and you lower P, you do what? You increase the market cap. So now suddenly, except for just uh, cups of coffee, maybe we can buy houses. That's going to mean you're going to have a, a higher growth, higher Q than the rate of QX. So, for example, uh, it's an increase market capitalization. Then TX, for example, grow at a lower rate than Q. So there's a faster growth in the economy than the block size. So we expect that on average, P will fall at least linearly or possibly faster with an increase in transactions. So what we have here is a relationship between the block size and the market capitalization. Rough relationship, and I emphasize rough, which is basic saying that as you increase the block size, you're gonna see the market capitalization, uh, sorry, as you increase the, the, mark, the transaction activity and block size, your market capitalization is gonna go from somewhere from linear to quadratic or higher. So the question then becomes the Monero adoption increases by a thousand times, does the price increase by a thousand times or a million times or do something else? Now, um, I gave a talk in, uh, the, in a virtual conference back in 2022, the um, Grey Hat Conference, and I'm gonna give a, a, a rough estimate on this by looking at trends. And essentially what you do, when I, what we did is, uh, you take the Price of, in USD, adjusted for inflation, dollars of daily transaction rate for Monero, Bitcoin, Litecoin, Dogecoin, Dash. And we'll look at how much the price of market capitalization has changed together with how much the block size has changed. So we look at this ratio of the, the TXs and we look at the transactions per day and we'll look at the proportion of the block size and we'll look at the market capitalizations. And so, in the first example, we looked at, uh, for BTC, the 90-day average ending on October 27, 2010, is also included. So we looked at the 90-day average price, basically, 
on two dates and then in two dates. And you took a linear interpolation. There are other ways to do this, but just to get a rough idea of is this a reasonable assumption? So what does it tell us? Y equals one indicates a linear relationship because it's a log scale analysis. Well, Y equals two, the price moves at the square of adoption. So essentially what we're saying is it's somewhere between one and two, roughly. A value indicates a relationship between linear and quadratic. This will become significant when we try to understand models of valuation and network and monetary part of theory. Okay, so I, I, push, I was chosen at the time to avoid clear market tops and bottoms, or provide a five year period, and I found 15 months after the Genesis block. The end date is arbitrary and it's related to the conferences. So it was an arbitrary date for the end that was really set just because I happened to have a conference date that day. So it was pretty arbitrary set, but not created directly. The coins were chosen to have an existence at least as long as Monero and were designed to be used as money originally, have a current transaction rate as comparable or greater than Monero and use proof of work as their consensus system. Now I avoided ledger forks such as Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin SV because a lot of complexities there introduced by those markets that I didn't want to get involved with. And this is my data source there, CoinMetrics.io. Okay. So then we look at the historical indicators. So if we take the range from October 2015 to October 27, we find that the growth of Monero was about 1.59, the exponent is 1.59. So between linear and quadratic, that's what we found for Monero. And Litecoin is slightly lower, just below 0.9. And Dash at 1.06. Okay, so you know, one can argue in those cases there hasn't been much change in what it was used for. That's all that's saying. But in that period, that dash is a good indicator, actually. Um, it's gone, fallen hard times more lately, but at that point, in that point in time, it was, had decent growth. Dogecoin was 2.3. That's interesting in the sense that maybe people were just buying it for fun rather than to engage in transactions, possibly, because the mem element of it. Interesting one is Bitcoin. From 2015 to 2020, 4.20. What is going on here? This is starting to not make a lot of sense. And then we look at Bitcoin from 2010 to 2015, comes in at 1.28, right where we weren't expected. So in the early days of Bitcoin, it's behaving the same model where the uh, block size is tracking the transaction rate block size. It's grow, you know, you see a, uh, a market cap, which is between one and two with the growth in the transaction rate of the block size. That's what you would expect. And Bitcoin, and then all of a sudden, in the, in the following period, it doesn't. It's a, Okay, this is the average 1.64, which is not that me meaningful for Bitcoin, in my opinion. And let's see the tail. So you have the summaries with 2015-2020, and, and you see 159.089, 106, 2.0. Then if you look at Bitcoin, 2010-2015, 1.28, that's pretty consistent, roughly. And your outlier is Bitcoin 2015-2020. to 2020. What happened? Well, what happened was that it hit the block size limit. And suddenly, you put a cap on on-chain transactions. And one can hypothesize what's going to happen here. This is what you expect from Metcalfe's law, which is between one and, 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 and the square. And we'll go back to the question for Monero, we've played 60,000 60, times. But we think about Bitcoin for a moment. So, what is happening? What is the, what's the anomaly here? What happened in that period, 2015, 2020, was this gap size. So we see the Bitcoin economy, and I would suggest the most likely model, is the Bitcoin economy moved from decentralized ledgers to the centralized ledgers of exchanges. So people were depositing Bitcoin in exchanges, using it as collateral to speculate on other transactions, or simply holding it in exchanges, and they weren't transacting on chain. So we've moved from a decentralized blockchain economy to one that is essentially a banking economy 
where the collateralized asset becomes uh, uh, Bitcoin rather than USD. A great example of this might be the Shiba wallet in El Salvador, where in fact the government sets up this wallet, buys a whole bunch of Bitcoin, and then turns around and creates a effectively something that looks to, in many ways like a uh, CBDC backed by Bitcoin. Le the, the wallets were actually linked to the ID of the individual uh, of the individual user. And how is this different in many respects from the gold standards of the 18th of the 19th century, where you had gold in a bank and the bank would issue receipts for the gold and that was the money? So it's essentially the same thing. You just replace gold with Bitcoin. But that's the kind of things that, that could be happening. Okay, so for Monero, possibly what we would expect on between linear and, and two for Bitcoin and many questions. And again, we have the question of the prices of Monero and other cryptocurrencies, like that of any asset. Now, I actually, and this is why the, the disclaimer question is very interesting, may be influenced by the madness of people, this can complicate the results. I made a financial decision in 2014, 2015, to sell my Bitcoin for Monero over this very issue, because I realized, wait a minute, this thing is supposed to be decentralized. They've put a cap. On, on, on the block size. Well, that's gonna cap the value if it stays all decentralized. So I better sell my Bitcoin for Monero and it was a wise decision, but not what I, as, as, as what I expected. I mean, I'm, I doubled the value uh, in, by holding Monero rather than Bitcoin in that period of time, but I would have expected much more. And the reason it didn't happen is because what I didn't take into account was the hidden portion of the Bitcoin economy, which is bank-based, exchange-based. So you make a financial decision, it makes sense on the surface, but then you turn around and find out there's something else you didn't take into account. So this is why it's very important, this is not financial advice. You have a theory, you make a financial decision, but wait a minute, I didn't take account of this. Um, but fundamentally what I'm saying is, I think your questions with Bitcoin with respect to, is it really decentralized? And it's really what it was designed to do. Okay. And so uh, for questions and discussion. Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans and if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, Gratuitous, and Monero. So any questions? There we go. Uh, Lightning would also contribute to that for Sorry? Bitcoin. Lightning would also contribute to that for Bitcoin, right? Because that's movement that doesn't show up on chain. That is correct. But what you have to take into consideration is the market capitalization of Lightning vis-a-vis -vis the market capitalization of Bitcoin. The amount of, of Bitcoin in Lightning is roughly about $100 million versus the $500 billion market cap of Bitcoin. So yes, in theory, Lightning would apply for that, but it doesn't uh, uh, explain the discrepancy just because of the size of the Lightning network. Now, it's quite possible the Lightning could be used as an on-ramp to a centralized wallet. And that's another interesting application. It's not really the intent of Lightning, but you would have like a, 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 a centralized wallet and you would fund it through Lightning. That's possible. But again, it's just too small right now. All right, thank you for this fascinating talk. I have a question. Um, so we're comparing Monero to Bitcoin mm -hmm. for the most part here. And for someone who's just getting into cryptocurrencies, um, should they be looking at some of the smaller privacy projects uh, who are looking to overtake Monero? Well, again, this is not financial advice. The first thing I will look when evaluating any cryptocurrency pro uh, uh, project, whether it involves privacy or not, is two things. Does it have a fixed number of coins? If you have a pre proof of work coin with a fixed number of coins on falling block rewards, you have exactly the same problems than in Bitcoin. 
So you're not going to solve that problem in something like Zcash, for example, which is smaller than Monero. Pirate chain, another example. I mean, they may have, quote, better privacy and some limited in interpretations, but if they don't have not addressed the fundamental issues of scaling and of security, which Monero has addressed and Bitcoin has not, then the answer is no. Um, I have really found very, nothing that I like in the crypto space right now other than Monero, to be honest. Possibly Ethereum, but again, they have so many questions of proof of stake. I'm not a believer in proof of stake. Uh, I mean, I, I, I personally, my personal opinion to, do, to diversify is I look at things like gold or even USD. Uh, if you, and the other thing to watch with a lot of projects is are they really Web3 or are they really decentralized? Because I'm fine with banks that are honestly regulated and called banks. I'm fine with cyber parks that are truly decentralized. But when you have an insolvent bank masquerading as a cypherpunk, I do not want to go near it. There was a very famous case, FTX, billions of dollars lost, the single largest, uh, maybe the single uh, money laundering uh, case in the United States history. You know, I, I would say, well, that could be the body by securing the money in Monero, but the point that I'm getting at is that there's a lot of stuff out there that I would not even go close. So my answer in general would be no. I always sound like a maximalist. If someone can show me something that's addressed, not just privacy, but all these critical issues, then that's what I would say. Any other questions? I have one more if I'm allowed to. Um, I'm wondering about your take on the role of V in that famous equation. Mm -hmm. You know, especially it seems like like with Bitcoin, like or or if something's de deflationary or, and people are holding it, that V term actually changes, and that needs to be taken into consideration too. Just um, in my opinion, that is a legitimate, very legitimate. It's a very good question, actually. Um, it comes down to the time cycle. Over a long time cycle, I would say B would come back. For a short term, particularly if there's a speculative frenzy, absolutely B, B would change. So it's quite possible that it's also, in the case of Bitcoin, B has driven up, um, a, a, a reduce in velocity is driving it up. And that could be consistent with a speculative frenzy, people buying the coins and just holding up them and not trading or anything simply for that reason. Uh, so in the short term, yes, B is a very critical point. Uh, and it could be part of this. So what we're saying here is not just banking, maybe it's just speculation. That's even, I think, scarier than my, my thesis, but it's a legitimate one, a very legitimate one. And that what we really are seeing is just unfounded speculation as opposed to uh, banking on centralized ledgers. I'm taking a more, shall we say, um, charitable approach by saying it's banking on centralized ledgers as opposed to just rampant speculation. But it's definitely quite possible. Any more questions? We have a question here. Ivan, um, I have a question regarding the total fixed supply. Don't Sorry? You, I have a question regarding the, to the total fixed supply of coins. Um, don't you think that, for example, regarding Monero, that uh, 0 0.6 XMR per block, do you think looking far in the future, it will be enough to secure the chain? Or do you think it might have to increase someday because the inflation will, will go lower and lower and maybe 0 0.6 XMR will not be enough to be as secure as, to, as today? It's a valid question. What we're asking here is, is the lost coins going to be so low that, for example, we would double the supply in 100 years, so we'll, even 100 years supply. I, I think that the stability, the, the stabilized number, it's going to be something. It's going to be a lot closer to the current money supply. It could even be below the nominal money supply. It might be twice as much, which still you're looking at a... Uh, an effective block reward of half of that. Um, the, the question that you raised is interesting because if you want to look at a coin that really got into trouble with this was Bitcoin, um, and they basically had to give up the ghost at around a tenth of Monero supply. So it would actually take 
about a millennium, actually, to do that. But the the um, the so I, I, I yes, it's possible we could we could stabilize at a higher number than than the um, than, than the sort of nominal um, eighteen million. It's also possible it could be like just about that figure or a bit lower. The other interesting data on this we're going to look at is what is the loss rate of cash, for example, in the United States? Is in that ballpark figure actually slightly higher? So that means how many coins get lost in, you know, pennies put in the bottom of sofas and that kind of stuff, and bills that get destroyed and so on. In gold, there's about there's some evidence for the lost gold, and that's about uh, it's a bit lower than than definitely lower than one than 0.6 percent. So I would say that the, stabil the stability point is going to be between, I would say within an order of magnitude, within within say twice to three times the existing amount or below the existing amount. Question. I was just thinking, wouldn't the, wouldn't the stabilization point be a function of how many people actually own Monero? Because if you think that the, the rate of loss is a, like a, a probability per person who owns Monero. So if more people own Monero, then uh, the rate would increase. So you're saying as, you, as adoption increases, the rate of losses would increase? The, 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 the total magnitude of loss would decrease okay. because the, the average amount held per person would be lower. Well, if the average per person is lower, I would actually argue that it, you got to look at market cap as opposed to the amount of Monero. Maybe not, then. So if we are assuming massive adoption, then you're also going to have a very significant increase in market cap. And the loss rate might be comparable. Because they're losing, you, the, the people have a lot less Monero, they're worth a lot more. So they're taking more care of it. Uh, it's an interesting question. If more people own it, is it going to be a faster or lower rate? Uh, and therefore, how is it going to stabilize over time? So is it going to reach a stability point and then kind of drift lower and then find a lower stability point because of adoption? It could be very likely, absolutely. When comparing privacy-preserving cryptocurrencies, um, what do you think about the argument that it's important to hide in the biggest crowd? Um, so there's two trains of thought here. The one is that the number of daily transactions is one of the most important properties of a privacy coin, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And the other one is just the purely technical privacy properties of that coin. So for example, Zcash might give you technically better privacy on a per transaction level. But in terms of the crowd you're hiding in, that's not necessarily the case. So how do you, um, how do you decipher that? Okay, let me give you another more extreme example, Ethereum. Hardly not much privacy on chain. But you have this 12 terabyte blockchain. Do you want to do blockchain surveillance on Ethereum or are you going to drown in the ether? I mean, that's an extreme example where you have very little privacy but a humongous chain. Size of the blockchain does help, as does the privacy islands within it. Um, by that I mean, you know, you know, you have one, one type one transaction, one output or two outputs, that kind of thing. Uh, or sorry, one input or two inputs. So yes, there is a dynamic between the two. As you grow a blockchain, you make it more private for a given privacy technology. Um, that's definitely the case. Um, you have to deal with the question that if you're going to do blockchain surveillance, it, it scales as the binomial coefficient, because essentially what you're doing, let's say you're, you're tainting certain uh, k outputs out of n. Well, the number of ways you can choose k out of n is, the, is basically the binomial coefficient. Um, uh, n factorial divided by uh, k factorial n minus k factorial. So that's going to give you the, the binomial coefficient. So blockchain surveillance scales very badly. So even relatively low privacy uh, could actually provide privacy issues by the sheer mass of it. And so when you're comparing privacy technologies, this is why Monero is way more private than Zcash. Yes, on an individual transaction, the Zcash Knox and Zcash is better. But when you factor in that it's a very small pool because it's, it's also an opt-in pool, 
And then you add to the fact that Monero's got a much higher transaction rate and it's mandatory, then the ring signatures in Monero are better than what you get in Zcash. One of the things you understand, if you have the whole pool as your mix set, it's still a finite mix set. So you gotta look, for example, what happens if I share Monero and I run out of enough times with 16 outputs, how, well, let's get up to a point, then I'm just gonna exceed the total number of outputs uh, in the in the blockchain. I'm gonna actually access the, uh, the whole blockchain in, in my mixing. Because it's basically, you know, you're going to 16 to the, to the one, to the two, to the three, to the four, et cetera. It's a finite number of outputs in the, in the chain. So yes, absolutely the size is relevant. Question? Yeah, just a quick question. Um, I know you were talking about fixed versus floating uh, supply. Uh, how do you see something like Ethereum with its uh, new kind of EIP 1559 model where they burn uh, some of the supply when transactions are uh, performed on the chain? Because ostensibly they have a floating supply, but then they have deflationary aspects to it because they're burning um, transactions. So, so can you repeat, can you sort of repeat that again? Yeah, I'm, I'm just like curious about what your view of, uh, of the Ether like the current Ethereum model mm -hmm. is, which is to have a floating supply, but then also have transactions which burn Ethereum irrevocably. Right, right. What they're doing is they're burning Ethereum. And then the question that you need to ask is how does it affect, first of all, Ethereum is now proof of stake. So are we actually reducing the staking amounts? If the staking amounts are constant and you accept, and this is a big exception, that um, the proof of stake is equivalent to proof of work, which I don't want to buy. But what I would say is it, they can then reduce the, the supply by burning coins. I mean, a, a simpler example of that, and then the answer is yes. I mean, that's a, that addresses a security problem in Bitcoin while keeping the maximum limit. The one example, an interesting coin that did this, it kind of died, while well, it's still around, I think it's called Frycoin. And what they did is they created a demurrage currency. And, and, what, and what they happened is they had a certain amount of demurrage, which is also the block reward. So you had a constant total of coins. They were burning it out through demurrage. And that was a block reward, so you had a constant supply. So I asked the other way. So burning it through transactions, which is the case of Ethereum, yes, you could actually create something where you reduce the supply uh, while at the same time uh, maintaining the security. So you just have a way to do it. Now, again, I gotta put caveats. I'm a big skeptic of proof of work, of scale, of, sorry, proof of stake. Uh, I may be proven wrong on this, but I am really a skeptic of that. But if you consider the same model on a proof of work uh, currency, then that will be the answer. So the, the cap supply is one design choice of a cryptocurrency. Um, another is, um, having a, a pre-mine or a dev tax. Uh, do you think that's a centralizing force in a cryptocurrency or how does that affect the long-term value of a, of a coin that it you're looking at? It is a highly centralized force in a cryptocurrency. And here's where I would suggest, read the initial guidance from FinCEN United States on this very issue. The minute you have a dev tax, the minute you have a uh, pre-mine, you're, you're crossing the boundary very close into money transmission. So now you have a legitimate argument for a, um, for regulators such as FinCEN, to get, I'm using the US example. You also have major questions as other things, is a security or not? Because now you're, you're creating a pre-mine and selling it, and that can easily constitute a security. I would say that a very sizable percentage of cryptocurrencies have serious problems with all sorts of regulators on this basis um, that we don't have. So, for example, in Canada, there's a whole bunch of assets that cannot be listed in Canadian exchanges because they're considered securities. Uh, and that's exactly this problem. Once you start pre-mining, once you put your hands into the till in the old fashioned way, stick your hands into the till, touch that money supply and decide I'm gonna spend it on this or I'm gonna spend it on that, that is centralizing because somebody's making that decision. One thing about Monero is it's 
Everything is funded through donations. So it's funded either people donating Monero and paying developers, developers donating their time, or hybrid situations where people pay Monero and the developer charges below the market rate. There's all sorts of variants of that, but ultimately it's entirely funded by donations. So anything like that, major trouble. That's my, my thought. And, and I think the regulators are cluing into this stuff. Thank you. And to wrap this up, uh, one final question to bring it back to the valuation question. Mm -hmm. um, so as we've seen, there's a, a huge herd instinct um, in crypto investing. Uh, people invest in the biggest thing that's out there. Bitcoin is always in the news. That's all they hear about. So the first coin that a person buys is usually Bitcoin. So size matters and people follow uh, the herd for the most part. So um, the other thing we discussed with privacy preserving cryptocurrencies is um, the tendency for people to want to hide in the biggest crowd, which right now is Monero. So combining these two um, herd instincts, one to hide in the biggest crowd and two to invest in, in the biggest thing that's out there, um, do you, do you feel that um, Monero is in a good position uh, going forward, or is there something that um, we need to be worried about or address? OK, let me answer two quick questions. First of all, the, following the herd for investing is a very dangerous game. It works for a while until you sell to the greatest fool, and you are the greatest fool. And then, at the top, you get slaughtered. And it's the old adage, pigs get slaughtered, uh, bears make money, bulls make money. And I sub subvert the pigs, it can be bear, bear pigs and bull pigs, because I've seen it also done the other way around at the bottom. So herd investing is a prescription for bankruptcy. Now, picking the largest one from a perspective of privacy, yeah, there's a fundamental reason you want to do that. And then you're weighing, yeah, for example, the, the strength of the privacy versus the size of the chain. That, you know, that, that's certainly the case. So that, that's a legit, so there's one fundamentally valid one and one fundamental one that is not. Long term, the, the biggest threat that I honestly see with Monero today is the issue of blockchain surveillance and particularly the blockchain surveillance companies. Because here what you've got is a bunch of companies that are built a business model about tracking transactions on Bitcoin and Ethereum that they can't really do. And in fact, we had a speaker yesterday on this very subject that it doesn't work. And I've been saying this for, for quite a while. But nevertheless, I've done a really good sale jobs on, on regulators. So for example, in the European Union, they're pushing to ban Monero from exchanges. That's going to have an impact on price. The flip side is, if they get called to task legally, which they could, then that will flip the other way. So I think that's the biggest negative that uh, Monero has right now. Her mentality on Bitcoin doesn't concern me as much because that corrects itself. But definitely the blockchain surveillance industry is a major threat to Monero, especially, and the thing to keep in mind with this is let's say you want to go off grid. Well, so you have your queue for Monero, and now you say, okay, there's a whole bunch of people that are doing KYC exchanges and all this kind of stuff, and a bunch of people that are off-grid. If you now kill that portion of Q that's, that's KYC, the Monero network doesn't know if a transaction is KYC or not. I put it to you that if you eliminate KYC use of Monero, there'll be inflation, in the, at least temporarily, in the non-KYC side of Monero because you've reduced the overall Q. So that's the argument that I would say. So, so if you think that you're going to be insulated from a disruption like this because you're off-grid, I'm saying, no, you're not. You're going to suffer inflation as a result of this. You know, so I'll end up with that. Any other questions? That's, it's oh, here. Can, you, can you come? Sorry. The cable's not long enough. So... Thank you. So how do you think about the psychological impacts of inflation uh, on a money? And if, for example, uh, pos relatively low but positive inflation incentivizes people to spend their money in the economy. Conversely, 
uh, deflation uh, encourages people to hold. Um, so how does Ethereum sort of make that, that, that state change from sort of this investable asset with a deflationary supply to... Um, I mean, I mean, a couple of, it's a, it's a bit of an interesting complex question, because first of all, if you look at the case of Monero, uh, people are not, Monero is not being used in isolation. So you have people that are dealing with inflationary money and would use going to Monero to spend just to cut down their friction. This comes back to the stableness aspect of it. So they are, the, the, it's not just driven by in Monero, it's driven by the inflation of the, of the fiat currencies. And the fact that you can eliminate your transaction friction, your transaction cost in Monero. So that's going to create action in Monero, quite irrespective of its own economy, as far as inflation is concerned. I don't know the case of Ethereum. I, I think that's a more of a case of a use case where, where you actually want to do stuff on it. And, and I don't think it, it's people are going to spend Ethereum if they want to do stuff on Ethereum. Um, they might turn around and say, I want to use Matic or Polygon. In fact, I, I attend an Ethereum group in Vancouver on a, re, on a regular basis, and, and that's what they're doing. They, they say, oh, it's also about Ether, but then when you get down to it, oh, we want to run a, a beverage machine that run Polygon on it. So it, it, it's, it's sort of the equivalent of having a, a, a meetup in, in, like this in, in Ethereum, but then when you go to the vendors, you, they take Polygon. So, I mean, they, 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 you are not living in Iceland here. Thank you, Arctic Mine.